The conversation continues with Sonia Poulton on today's News Talk TNT. Well, I'm glad to see the comments coming in are all echoing exactly what I think about Adrian Hanks. Lovely messages from Drumstick and Hope, Love and Peace and We Fat Shug and Peter Folder and Holly. I met Holly on the streets of London outside the dear Royal Courts of Justice. It was an absolute pleasure, as I say, to meet so many great TNTers. So we are continuing the conversation about Julian Assange about the last two days at the Royal Courts of Justice in London. I'm delighted to be joined by what actually stands for true journalism these days? And you don't get to say that very often. Taylor Hudak, just Taylor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. You've been in the High Court for the last two days. Taylor is a journalist for The Last American v Vagabond and uh, American, Hungarian. And we're going to be talking about, well, Assange and freedom of speech and what it all means and journalism. Journalism is not a crime, right, Taylor? Yes, exactly. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I was outside the courthouse in what may have been Julian Assange's final appeal hearing domestically in the UK. The case is now left with two high court judges who will issue a judgment determining whether or not Assange is able to appeal before the UK courts once more or if he enters into the extradition process. Still, there may be an opportunity to pursue the European Courts of Human Rights, but it is now with these two judges to make a determination on where this case goes from here. And you see, the thing is, is that you and I both, I, mean, I, I don't know your exact position on this. For me, it's unquestionably a political issue. But the fact is, is that the uh, American barristers, they have made the case that it is not political, that it is absolutely criminal. Where do you stand on that? Well, this is certainly a political case because Mr. Assange is charged with 17 counts of espionage for the receipt and publication of classified material. This is an unprecedented case. Never has a journalist been published for espionage, with espionage for conducting journalistic activity. That's precisely what's happening in this case. And that is what makes this a political case. And this was a really important point that was brought up initially by the defense, of course, when they brought forth their arguments on Monday during the first day of this phase of the extradition hearings. And they stated that under the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty, Article 4 prevents extradition to the United States for political purposes. So that in and of itself should prevent Mr. Assange from being extradited. However, the prosecution is trying to go about this in a clever way, I guess, or really sort of um, manipulating the laws here. And they're referring to the UK Extradition Act of 2003, that is domestic law, which does not include this provision, which prevents extradition from the UK to the US for political purposes. Now, the interesting point here is that you have the prosecution citing and using the treaty, of course, to extradite this man. However, when it comes to the safeguards and protections that he is afforded within this treaty, they want to ignore that. So it's quite convenient for them. But this is absolutely a politically motivated case. And at the very end of the hearing yesterday, the defense lawyer, Mark Summers, even stated that this is by prosecution. Yes, absolutely. Well, give us some idea of, of your thoughts on, on the judges, obviously, um, Dame Elizabeth Sharp, uh, Justice Jeremy Johnson. What, what, you know, what were your observations of them in, in terms of the arguments that were being put forward? I noticed that they were asking quite a few questions and they seemed to be listening intensely and they did not show any inherent bias toward Assange, which is different from what we've seen during the previous hearings. And I noticed this and other journalists who were covering this case as well had also noticed the same thing, which, which is a good thing. And in fact, yesterday there was a really important moment where the prosecutor kept reciting the same incorrect uh, set of facts here. She was stating that Assange had released these publications and included unredacted names. This is completely false. In fact, these documents were published by other organizations unredacted before WikiLeaks. However, she kept stating that WikiLeaks was the first to publish and that they did not redact the names when it's the opposite. And in fact, it was one of the judges who said to the prosecutor, Claire Dobbin, and said, well, by the way, it was actually these other organizations who published 
before WikiLeaks published. And this really points to the selective nature of this prosecution. So here, Mr. Assange is being published or being prosecuted for his activities through WikiLeaks, but these other organizations are not being pursued. And then the prosecutor went on to say that the reason that these other organizations were able to obtain these documents was due to Mr. Assange, the fact that he obtained them uh, from the U.S. Army, which doesn't make much sense because then that means that Mr. Assange is responsible for the actions of other journalists. And I could tell that the judge in that moment was just not really liking this argument from the prosecutor, and and he was uh, thinking deeply about it. I was very um, sure to be looking at their faces to try to get a sense of what was going through their minds. Of course, we can never know for sure, but I will say this, and that is that I am pretty optimistic that they are going to allow him to appeal, at least on some grounds. I I do think they will. Now, when that decision is going to be uh, issued to the public, it's unclear. I expect maybe a few weeks or several months. Right. Interesting. So um, you see, your general feeling was that, that this was being dealt with as fairly as possible. But as you said, you know, there have been issues, haven't there, before where, where judges have there have been allegations of um, vested interests. And there was a concern that these two judges may be rather too close to the British establishment. But from what you're relaying to us, Taylor, there is a sense that they were far more questioning than they've probably been given credit for. Yes, there was a difference between these two judges, I would say, compared to others. But let me be clear as well. It's I'm not going to be too optimistic in a situation. Right. I still have some, some skepticism, of course. I, I am, you know, cautiously optimistic in this situation. There were a lot of problems when it came to open justice with this case, even with this last appeal hearing. And it was up to the judges to make the determination as to which journalists can enter the courtroom and how the seating arrangements were. And it was very difficult to cover. So I want to be clear that I'm not saying that this was uh, a perfectly executed case uh, by any means, but it was, I I can tell a change in attitude. I will say that. Now, there's one point that I do want to make clear to some of the viewers, and that is that we learned, and this has been discussed a little bit before as well, but once Assange is, if he is extradited to the United States again, it's unclear if he will be, and we certainly hope that that would not happen. There still is an opportunity to prevent that, of course. But if extradited, once he lands on U.S. soil, there is an opportunity for the U.S. government to bring forth additional charges, which could be treason, for example, which would make him eligible for the death penalty. And of course, European governments and the UK government will not extradite to countries, and that's in the uh, treaty as well, they will not extradite someone to the United States if that person is eligible for the death penalty. So this was also a point that was brought up in court in a very uh, strong point that he could still face additional charges, namely for, say, the Vault 7 documents, which exposed uh, CIA spying on innocent civilians, rogue killings and uh, serious corruptions on behalf of the U.S. intelligence agencies. And we know, of course, that once this publication was released, this deeply upset the CIA, embarrassed the U.S. government, and it led CIA director at the, the CIA director at the time, Mike Pompeo, to refer to WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence agency. So we have to be um, very aware here that he he could face the death penalty if they bring forth charges. And 175 years in prison is the maximum sentence that he could face. That in and of itself is is also a death sentence in a a sense. Yes, 100%. But the US, of course, they're very keen to play down any ideas like this. They they say they've given assurances of fair treatment, but uh, Assange's team say that can't be trusted. It's absolutely possible he'll be treated disproportionately. And as you outline, once he touches down on American soil, so it's about getting him there, isn't it? It's about getting possession of him. Absolutely. That's my sense. And we know that there was an article that was released in Yahoo News that revealed that there were serious plans to kidnap him or addition him to the United States. However, they were hesitant to do so because they did not have any charges against him. And then shortly thereafter, they decided to charge him around 2016, 2017, which was another point that was raised in court by the defense, which is that these publications that he is charged with were released around 2010. So why did it take six or seven years 
for right. these charges against him to be brought forward. And it it could be, again, this is circumstantial evidence, but one of the points addressed was that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, announced that it was preparing to investigate the U.S. government due to the revelations by WikiLeaks, and they would need Julian Assange to help in that investigation. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the CIA director, as I said, started to refer to WikiLeaks as a non-state hostile intelligence agency, and this has some legal weight, and it did instill a feeling of hostility and aggression toward WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Do you know, it's it's so interesting. One of the things that uh, our reporter, Gemma Cooper, was talking about earlier was about the weight on Stella Assange and, and how just incredible she's been throughout all of this. She, she, you know, talks about it with such incredible clarity, given how emotional this must be for her. But one of the things that she said repeatedly over the last two days is the world is watching. Did you get a sense that the judges were absolutely aware that that more people than ever are watching this case with interest? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. And I think that's why they were quite strict with the press and those who were allowed to enter into the courtroom is because they know this is a very high profile case. Both days when I uh, approach the courthouse to enter into the courtroom, I was really blown away by how many people were present outside the courthouse. It was more than usual. I would say several hundred were there, and they were there very early in the morning. I want to say like 6 a.m. I heard, and they were there all day long showing their support for Assange, protesting, demonstrating, all peacefully, of course. And it just shows how unpopular this continued prosecution is. And I think it's time that he be released, of course. That time has come already. He should have been released a long a long time ago. He should have never been imprisoned. He should have never been charged because this puts every journalist at risk, in particular national security journalists at risk of facing prosecution from other governments. Yes. How was it received when his team was talking about the plots against him, such as the alleged CIA plot? How was that you know, received by the judges? Yes, that's an interesting question. So they listen intently. I do not think my best memories, I do not think that they followed up too much on this point, but I did, I can say that the prosecution did not get into this issue, uh, did not discuss this issue uh, much further when they had their opportunity to rebut the arguments. But I can't imagine that the judges hear this and feel comfortable. I would hope that they would not feel comfortable extraditing a man to the very country whose intelligence agency conspired to assassinate him. I hope that they feel a heavy burden on themselves if they if they were to allow this extradition to to go ahead. Um, that's my you know biggest hope here is that they have they see the humanity in all of this. And as you said, Stella Assange has been bravely advocating for his release and is obviously deeply personally impacted by this and has two sons she has to raise on her own and it's important to remember that, yes, this is a journalist who published great work, but there are others in his life, friends, family members who are deeply impacted by his being imprisoned as well. Absolutely fair point. And of course, the U.S. lawyers were very keen to say that he's been misrepresenting this case. What did you think about that? Yes, well, they tried to separate Julian Assange's actions from that of a journalist, which was just a terrible argument meant to make. And again, I was able to speak to other journalists covering this. We all came to the same conclusion that we could not believe what we were hearing. They were trying to state that Assange was somehow um, engaging in criminal activity by asking his source at the time, Chelsea Manning, for more information, asking for you know more leaks, for more information. Well, this is what journalists do all the time. You ask <laughs> for more information. You, you try to get one last question. And this is normal activity. And they're seeking to criminalize this. This is a very dangerous precedent that could be could be set on a global scale. And also I had, you know, I was thinking to myself, who has the right to decide who is and who is not a journalist? Should we allow public officials, lawyers, right. or judges to decide who is and who is not a journalist? I don't think so. That's a very dangerous pathway. Absolutely. It's it's often used in legal cases though. Um, it, it, you know, it's a sort of an old trick, but uh, so, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we can't possibly know the outcome. We can guess. But what are your thoughts? You, are you feeling, I mean, as you said at the start, you know, we want to be optimistic and all those things. But what is your sense of, of what may come from this? Yes. Yeah, so we left off the hearing with the two judges 
advising the two parties involved, that is the defense and the prosecution, to meet deadlines with regard to submitting the relevant documentation. And I believe that it is quite likely that we'll receive a decision not for maybe several months. And the reason I say that is just because when I look back on previous decisions made in this case, it took 10 months from for the last decision to, to come through. So if I look back on the history and expect maybe the same to happen again, then we're looking at many, many months. And then also, too, there's been some discussion about the fact that there's a U.S. election coming up. Perhaps the Hi. Biden administration does not want a journalist uh, being extradited to the United States, it's not a good look. And so this case may be further delayed. And also during the uh, first part of the extradition hearings back in 2020, the judge also made a point that she was considering, and she did in fact eventually, uh, she was considering delaying her decision on extradition back in 2020 until after the U.S. election. And she did issue her decision on January 4th of 2021. So it could be that this is dragged out even further. But we knew going into this that the extradition process is lengthy. And all the while, uh, Assange is in Belmarsh prison this entire time with some of oh. the country's worst criminals. And it's it, uh, it's very difficult and he is suffering and, and was quite unwell to the point where he was unable to attend the hearings. And he right. always has attempted in the past, I believe, to attend these hearings, but was unable to make it due to health. So people should also be aware of that as well. Absolutely. I just want to echo what Chris is saying in our comments. It's really good to hear what was going on in the courtroom. Absolutely. Taylor, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We truly appreciate it. You giving us a bird's eye view of what was taking place in uh, Court 5, Royal Courts of Justice over the last two days. This has been Thursday's edition of the Sonia Poulton Show. That is the rather brilliant Taylor Hudak. We will see you tomorrow. Take excellent, excellent care of yourself.